Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. What brings you to a place where all you want to do is sit in the back of the room and and poop all over somebody else's act while they're working, especially if you know how hard it is to do? The difference can't be, uh, give me 20 bucks and now you're a magician. The difference has to be, you've put forth the time, energy, and effort uh, to prove that you want to to become sugar rather than taste sugar. It was an old sideshow stunt. I, I was a kid rooting around with a Q-tip and it just slid right into my nostril. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. What's up guys, Xavier Katana here. You were listening to The Human Experience and wow, what an amazing episode with Mr. Brian Brushwood who has made a career on influencing human perception. We cover everything in this episode from illusion to cold reading. We especially go into how feeble memory is and such an amazing episode to have our 100th episode on. And with that, there's a few people I want to thank. The show would not be possible without my producer, Josh. Josh, thank you so much for your consistent, very hard work. Kimmy, she's one of our writers. She's the female version of Hunter S. Thompson. Kimmy, thank you so much for everything you do for us. Casey, also one of our writers. Amazing, amazing literary genius. Casey, thank you so much for all of your work. And finally, Jasmine. Jasmine, thank you so much for helping out with the show. There are other people that I could probably mention here, but those are the four people on our team that make everything that you hear possible for us. So huge amount of gratitude to them. And again, this episode was a lot of hard work. Getting to a hundredth episode of anything is pretty difficult. So we did it. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you guys enjoy this one. The Human Experience is in session. My guest for today is Mr. Brian Brushwood. Brian, my good sir, thank you for making the time. Welcome to HXP. Oh, man, I'm so glad we finally got to make this happen. This is going to be a blast. Yeah, likewise. You know, I've, I've followed your career for a while now. For anyone who doesn't know, why don't you give us a little bit of an introduction on how you got into what you're doing right now? Sure, sure. So uh, May of 99, I quit my day job because I had visions of doing a punk rock blood and guts magic show and touring all over the United States. So after about uh, 10, 15 years of that, started hosting a show called Scam School, all about how to win free drinks at the bar by using magic and trickery. And out of that came uh, the television project Hacking the System that I did for National Geographic. And now it's 2.0 iteration called The Modern Rogue that me and my buddy Jason Murphy do. Yeah, I love that show. I love the little techniques that you show on you know, credit card skimmers and all this different stuff, how to hit a bullseye in one shot. How did this start for you? How did you begin this interest in kind of hacking the system and, and showing people you know, how to sort of alter their lives? Sure. Well, uh, for the modern rogue, it was a very simple idea. Like if basically if Houdini, James Bond and uh, uh, I, I don't know, um, uh, Magnum P.I. had a baby, it would be the modern rogue. And it's like the idea of this perfect man's man. What would he know? He would know everything from how to talk his way past the velvet rope. Uh, hot wire a car, handle himself in a fight. And so, you know, here Jason and I, a couple of doughy 40 year olds, begin this quest to try to become this ultimate paragon of badassness. Uh, but I think all of it came from a place, as long as I can remember, I've always been interested in thinking around problems with clever solutions. I think that's what attracted me to magic early on mm-hmm. and, uh, and certainly, you know, fueled the ideas behind hacking the system and now the modern rogue. I absolutely love that. I love that. So when you're in this sort of state where you're talking to someone, what are you using to affect their perception? Uh, you mean on a day-to-day basis or, or on stage or when we're on camera? 
more when you're doing a trick, when you're going up to people or when you're, when you're busking in front of a large crowd. I mean, is there a sleight of hand process that you use? Is there something that you keep in mind when yeah, you're doing as, this? Uh, as a matter of fact, I didn't have words for it. I think in, in many ways, magicians are sort of uh, folk psychologists. You know, for, for thousands of years, farmers, they didn't know anything about genetics, but they did know that when you combine these two plants, you tended to get a better yield when you rotated crops, when the, the, the land was treated a certain way. You know, they didn't know why it worked. They just know that it worked. And I think in many ways, magicians have been essentially psychologists or uh, folk neuroscientists for years. And it wasn't until I read the book Incognito that talks about, you know, we think of ourselves as the person in charge of everything. But the more we learn about brain science, the more we realize that the brain is, is basically like Congress. You got all these different parts of the brain that are arguing for different things. And usually they have to come to some kind of consensus to pull it off. Hmm. And once I read that, I realized that intuitively, when I'm doing magic, even now, as, as we're having this conversation, there's another part of my brain sketching out, making sure that we're going to be able to button this up, that it's going to segue into something interesting. Likewise, when you're doing magic, there's a physical element to it. You have to be present, focused on the other person. You have to be speaking and essentially lying with your eyes and your body presence and the things that you're saying, while secretly what you really care about is whether or not your ring finger is properly positioned on the coin so that you're able to palm it in a few seconds. I, I, I love it. I'm fascinated by the human psychology of it, the social engineering of it. Was NLP a big factor for you, like neuro-linguistic programming? Do you study that at an early yeah, age? I, I, read, I read a fair amount of it. NLP is a quirky one in that the stuff that's most useful is also the most kind of transparent stuff like mirroring, uh, matching the body language, the pace, the tenor, the volume of other people's stuff. I got a little turned off when you get to some of the stuff that sounds a little bit like voodoo, like, ah, if you look up and to the left, you're remembering from the past. And yeah. anytime a chart gets involved and you start labeling stuff, yeah, that, that felt to me like uh, a little bit too pseudoscience-y for me. But I do like the core idea of it, the idea of essentially using your, your mirror neurons to, to project into what somebody else is thinking based on their body language and so on. Human perception is such a big component in the way advertising works, so what we see every day. Is there a, an element of your trade that kind of exploits that? Absolutely. And one of the biggest and most pleasing surprises that I've learned in an entire 20-year career in magic is just how malleable memory is, how, what lousy videotape recorders our brains are. There's a dated reference for you. The fact that the moment I do a trick, all I have to do is recap and say it ever so slightly different from the way I did it, the moment they hear those words, they're picturing it done that way. And sure enough, it scrubs the, the memory. You know, when we remember things, we don't remember the way they actually happen. We remember the last time we told ourselves the story of it, which is why Elizabeth Loftus has done some of this amazing memory work where not only does she prove that we don't remember things very well, but that it's astonishingly easy to plant false memories. For example, mm -hmm. Uh, she did one experiment where she divided a class into group A and group B. All of them were shown the exact same footage of uh, two cars colliding. But, uh, and they all had, for the most part, the same set of questions. But one of them was asked, how fast do you think the cars were going when they collided? The other group was asked, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? Hmm. And just that tiny difference in language, it shifted the lens through which they viewed it. So as a result, two or three weeks later, when they were asked follow-up questions, like, was there blood at the scene? Was there broken glass? The folks who had been asked the questions smashed into were much more likely to report those things that didn't even happen. So as a magician, you know, we rely on that. Uh, the, the moment the trick is over, or, or even while the trick is happening, and we're recapping what happened just five minutes ago, there'll be carefully selected language that causes people to be like, yeah, no, I do remember that. I remember that. I remember that. All while massaging away the real heat that we want to avoid on the actual moment we did the trickery. Yeah, that's so important, so crucial to everything that you're doing. Um, there was a time in your life where you were working for the computer industry, you were offered a raise, but you chose to give yourself a year to try to make it in the magic industry. What happened during that year? What sort of directed your career into what you're doing now? Sure. So when I went to college, uh, I did a exclusive honors program where the first two years you took the classes they told you to, but the last two you took whatever was related to your thesis. And I thought it would be great to do something magic related. 
and somehow talked my way into doing a magic show as a creative writing thesis, which meant that the last two years of college, I took classes like history of witchcraft, pseudoscience and the paranormal, psychology. Uh, it was a, a blast. And the whole time I thought like, oh, look at me, I'm getting away with having fun instead of, you know, everyone else is writing papers and whatnot. Mm. But by the time I graduated, I had a good little 30 minute show. And so even as I had a day job, I would live for Wednesday nights when I would go down to perform just off of 6th Street and pass the hat. And I started to pick up a bit of corporate work on the side. And this was another company that was a, kind of a peer of the group I was working with during the day. So I get up there on stage, I do a performance, and uh, it's going really well. But I find out afterwards that apparently there was somebody sitting in the back of the room who grew up in the circus or was familiar with sideshow stunts. And he basically held court. And just uh, every time I would do a trick, people would run to the back and he'd say like, oh, that's no big deal. You just do this. And uh, that's a dumb trick. I know that. I know this. And I, it occurred to me, what brings you to a place where all you want to do is sit in the back of the room and, and poop all over somebody else's act while they're working, especially if you know how hard it is to do. Mm. And then as a mental exercise, I projected myself 20 years in the future. And I was like, okay, imagine you're a, a middling vice president at, at this tech company. And it's a big holiday extravaganza. They hire some magician and all the attention's on him. Everybody's clapping for him. Uh, and it, it, you never went for it. You never knew whether or not you would be able to pull it off. And I could picture myself being that bitter bastard sitting in the back of the room, crapping on someone else's act. So what happened was once I got a raise, I realized, oh, this is the first step of a, of, of a thousand mile journey that very likely gets me to a place where I spend my whole life wondering what might have been, and I become that bitter bastard in the back of the room who could only feel important by crapping on someone else's act. So as a direct result, I never thought, e even as I quit, I didn't think magic was going to work out full time. But I did know that after that year, even if I racked up a bunch of debt and had to go back to work, I knew that for the rest of my life, I would never have to be that bitter bastard because I could say, yeah, man, I spent a year touring. I couldn't quite hack it, but at least I would know, you know? Right. And so. As a result of that, uh, you know, my wife was kind enough to keep the lights on. And a year into it, I'd made garbage money. Like I grossed less than half of what I had made that previous year. But at the end of that year, I saw how it could be done. And I was like, mm -hmm. Bonnie, quit your job. Come with me. Let's do this. And, uh, you know, it's, it's grown slowly and steady with, with a lot of work and a lot of setbacks. But uh, now I no longer have to wonder <laughs> what might have been. <laughs> yeah, very, very intriguing. One of the things that really interests me is just the perceptual threshold that we all have. There's a magician out of the UK, Darren Brown, who I jumped into his work and I just found it fascinating how much of the psychology involved in doing this stuff is and how much we can sort of manipulate what someone is perceiving at any given moment. There's a part of your act which involves kind of nailing a, a, a nail into your face. What does that involve? <laughs> well, well, so yeah. Well, first of all, to, to Darren Brown. Darren Brown is truly an amazing talent and a phenomenal performer. He just did a run of shows in New York, and I'm, I'm very sad that I missed it, but everybody said amazing show stuff about it. Uh, the real brilliance of Darren Brown was that he figured out that if I tell you I was on a journey in far East India and got struck by lightning, and now I have the power of telepathy, you're going to roll your eyes and be like, that's not true. But if he mixes in enough real psychology with a bit of, you know, trendy, fringy pop psychology, he's still doing the same trick. He's still telling you what your card is, but you view it through a different lens and you see it from that perception of like, oh, wait, no, I, I do believe all this. And so that's the funnest part for me is as a magician, trying to pinpoint that exact moment when he flips from, you know, talking about the actual psychology to like, OK, we're in trick mode. Some people have criticized Darren Brown for being a little too comfortable with leaving people with the impression that he used psychological techniques to program them rather than making it clear that this is a, a fantasy, that this is a magic trick. But to me, I love the challenge of that stuff. And I think he's um, backed off from some of that from his television shows back in the day. But, mm -hmm. but the effect you're talking about, uh, hammering a four and a half inch nail in your nose, that's, a, that's an old sideshow stunt called the human blockhead. And the idea is very simple. If you've ever seen the cutaway of the human skull, uh, you've got uh, your sets of sinuses, your, your frontals are up top, and then your maxillary sinuses are the ones that curve down and become your throat. Someone has a feeding tube, they basically run a tube up the nose 
and straight down in, into the belly. And when I do that effect, it's basically sword swallowing in miniature. Mm. I actually feel that nail touching the back of my throat when it ends. Wow. I mean, it makes for really good stage, you know, entertainment. When I look at your work and I, when I was watching the YouTube videos that I've been watching through this week, how much of this is for your own personal amusement versus just entertainment? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I think almost everything in the show began with uh, something that was interesting to me. Uh, in fact, even the human blockhead, years before I knew it was an old sideshow stunt, I, I was a kid rooting around with a Q-tip, and it just slid right into my nostril. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool, uh, and then forgot about it. And it wasn't until years later, I'm watching the Jim Rose Circus Sideshow, and I'm watching people literally faint at Lollapalooza in 1992 at the sight of that because they were so horrified. And I realized that, uh, that that show did something very clever in that they primed everyone to say, what you're about to see is so extraordinary. There absolutely will be people fainting at this show. When this happens, we have a procedure. Everybody just, the folks around, I want you to point down, we'll get paramedics right over. By priming the viewers to believe that what you are about to see is going to have such a shocking impact that people are going to faint around you, of course, you know that became the reality. Uh, and so I, I actually, uh, by, by doing the weird sideshow stuff mixed with the sleight of hand and mind reading, my goal is to take what is traditionally a very jaded audience. You know, college mm -hmm. students are not known for being in love with magic shows because most of them, last time they saw them, was at a 12-year-old's birthday party. And so as a result, I walk out and the first thing I do is the fire eating. It's this virtuosic skill. Uh, there is no trick to it. It's just, you know, really impressive to watch the kind of, you know, the juggling, the tossing of a flame from one torch to another. And then there's this contract that I have to build because some audiences are conservative. They don't want to see a, a dude shove nails in his eyes, but I need to seduce them into doing it. So after doing the fire eating, the first thing I ask is I was like, okay, we have a very important question. We can move and try some traditional magic, or we could do some freaky stuff. What's it going to be? And of course, every audience shouts out freaky stuff. And even if they're a more conservative, older audience, at that point, they've all shouted that they want freaky stuff. So it sort of uh, it, it, it cuts off that ability for them to be suddenly horrified and disgusted when I start doing the human blockhead because they asked for the freaky stuff. And so mm. everything keeps going one step forward, one step forward, and you take the audience on this bizarre journey where somebody who didn't think they would be cheering for a bunch of blood and guts and be cutting off my tongue on stage, uh, they've been primed and warmed up to that point where they're all, all in. Huh, it's very interesting. So with Scam School, the large element of this is that you reveal what you're doing at the end. Do you get a lot of flack from other magicians or other performers when you are revealing these tricks? I'll tell you what, it has been a fascinating 10 years. Uh, I had the idea for Scam School 10 years ago this month. It was during the summer of 2007 that I pitched it. And at the time, the only thing anywhere close to what I was wanting to do was the Magic Secrets Revealed specials, which, uh, you know, obviously upset a whole bunch of magicians. Yeah. They, they ended up, you know, try, trying to sue Fox and so on. But to me, the, the crime of that show was um, so here's the question is what is the difference between teaching and exposure so that mm. show was very much exposure you saw a magic box you saw the girl get in you had a moment of magic then they took a giant dump on magic and say yeah it's dumb it's just a trick and you're a sucker for liking magic so yes they exposed the effect no the people watching did not get any closer to being able to perform it whereas on the flip side uh scam school the way i wanted to present it was each one beginner appropriate something that you could watch today, later that night, be two and a half beers in, half remember the trick, and still be able to pull it off. Because to the core of the difference between teaching and exposure is when the lesson is over, can you do the trick? If you mm. can do the trick, then clearly you are taught. If you can't do the trick, then all that's happened is you've scratched the itch of your curiosity, and that would be exposure. And so mm. uh, I was terrified that there would be a big backlash, and I kept waiting for it to happen. And instead, what happened is over the last 10 years, magicians had to wrestle with the question of what is fair? Because there were some people who felt like, well, you're just giving it away for free on the internet. And I was like, well, but you got it for free when you got a magic kit when you were a kid. You got it for free when you went to the library. You know, the, the, the difference can't be uh, give me 20 bucks and now you're a magician. The difference has to be you've put forth the time, energy, and effort uh, to prove that you want to to become sugar 
rather than taste sugar. That's the difference is people who enjoy magic get to taste sugar. But if you make that decision that you want to be sugar instead, it's a lot less sexy, but it is very, very satisfying to bring that kind of joy to other people. It could go either way, really, because in one sense, you're, you're keeping other magicians, other mentalists on their game, and you're asking them to kind of improve their skill set. And in the other direction, it's like, oh, well, you just gave away this, you know, this trick that I've been studying and learning for the last six months. Well, keep in mind, magicians have a saying, if you want to keep a secret, put it in a book. Uh, it is, uh, I think I Googled on or checked on Amazon and there was over a hundred thousand different titles, uh, books that had magic in it to some degree. So obviously magicians aren't concerned with secrecy as much as they say they will, because everybody, the moment you come up with a slight derivation, everybody puts it in a book, they publish it in magazines and so on. Hmm. So, uh, but, but I do think that there's, uh, it's important how you present it. And in that regard, I'm not going to pretend like it's my job to keep other magicians or working performers on their toes. Uh, mm -hmm. I, th I think it, any working professional knows that's hard enough as it is. What I am interested in is minting new magicians. I want very much for Scam School to be a kind of a gateway drug to get people uh, a taste of that high of having deceived someone. And that's both because I want more people doing magic as an art and I want more people uh, literate about magic so that they could tell the difference between good magic and bad magic. But also, I think even for the folks who pick up magic for a little bit and then, and then set it aside, I think you're fundamentally changed once you've experienced what it's like to deceive another human. And, and I think it arms you to better prevent yourself from being deceived. When I was uh, 18 or 19, I was working at a movie theater cash register, and a guy and a girl come walking in. Girl walks all the way down to the far end and asks about the candies. The guy starts talking to me, saying he needs change for a poker game later today. So we start to make a change for a 20 and a 50 and up and down. And along the way, I think, man, there's something about the cadence and the rhythm of this. This feels like a magic trick. And unfortunately, I didn't have the wherewithal to stop everything and call the manager right there. But the moment he left, I was like, that felt like a magic trick. And I only knew that because. I had been doing magic, and sure enough, we counted the till, and it was $50 light. And so that's something that I wouldn't have even known anything was afoot if it weren't for magic. And with a little more experience, I certainly don't think I would be taken for a ride like I was as uh, now. So it's my hope that folks who get into just a little bit of magic with Scam School will either become somebody who gets into a lot of magic or somebody who's better armed to not get suckered by all the, the fraudsters out there. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. I really like that. What is, what is the sort of protocol when a trick goes wrong? You don't ever stop a trick in the middle, do you? Or do you kind of admit to failure? Oh, uh, you know what? It depends. Um, uh, for example, there is one stage show piece that I do where I get two people from the audience and one of them is blindfolded and has a box over his head so there's no way he can see. And the other person you know, thinks of an image and draws it on the poster board. And then hopefully at the end, the, the version that the guy in isolation draws exactly matches. And, you know, there's a lot of variability in it because I really, I don't set anything up ahead of time. While I'm talking and giving the instructions, I'm looking to see how well they're paying attention and whether or not they're following along. But one in a hundred performances, we get to that last part and it's eight minutes of comedy and build up all to this one moment where we're going to reveal the two pictures and hopefully they'll match. And one in a hundred times, they just don't match at all, not even close to it. And when that happens, it is amazing because I turn them around and everybody laughs because they don't match. And I just end the routine saying, and that's why I don't believe in ESP. Let's have a big, big round of applause for both of them. And everybody claps and you go on with the show. This is a, they call it the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, which is you shoot the bullet, then you draw the target around it. So in this case, I don't announce everything that's going to happen at the beginning. I don't say, hey, we're going to grab two people. They're going to think of pictures. The pictures are going to match because that would pin me into that being the only outcome. Whereas if I begin by saying we're going to try an experiment, an ESP, second sight, psychic phenomenon, and, and we get volunteers and it's a fun, funny process the whole way. The only thing that's different is at the end. They don't happen to match, but I never said they would match. I said we were going to do an experiment. And then the punchline is just, and that's why I don't believe in ESP. On a more um, localized, uh, you know, when you're doing table hopping or talking, 
performing maybe a card trick or whatever. Maybe you need somebody to take a certain card, but they don't take that card. The nice thing is, is nobody knows where you're supposed to end up. And as long as you continue to tell an interesting story, you can take anyone along for the ride. And, and as long as there's a good ending, and it doesn't have to be the ending you intended, because what will happen is, is there's some tricks where maybe I'll get halfway through and it's very clear they didn't follow instructions. They don't have the right card. Uh, I can't finish the trick as I had intended. But at that point, I might recap like, all right, let's be totally fair. You did blank, 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 blank. Great. Remember your card. And then, and then turn on and then say, now your turn. And, and I, as if I'm setting up the next phase, when really I just never get around to finishing the first guy's trick. <laughs> I didn't admit defeat. I didn't make the person feel bad. I, I didn't guilt them for not following instructions. Instead, I said, you've done a very good job. You followed everything exactly right. Let me press pause on this. Now we're going to do this other stuff. And I think you'll see where this all ends up. And of course, uh, statements like that basically satisfy the itch in their mind of knowing, okay, this will pay off at some point. And even if it doesn't, by that point, hopefully you're three or four tricks into the other thing to where the worst thing that could happen is after the show, they're all like, hey, what was that? What, whatever happened with my card? And then, which, you know, you could be honest, be like, oh, you know what? I, I didn't get back to that. But here, let me show you another trick. Let me do a different one for you. As long as you provide some kind of value and you, and you scratch that itch, uh, people will stay with you. Huh. It's intriguing. I love this stuff. It's, uh, I absorb it as much as I can. So, <laughs> Brian, I, I want to know about, there was a, a trick that you did on Scam School where you mind control by way of poetry, which was later oh, performed yeah. by uh, Richard Garriott on the International Space Station. How does that trick work? Uh, this is quite possibly the single best thing I ever did on Scam School. We had this idea. So, um, <laughs> the, the way that the effect works and the beauty of this is that you could do it over the phone. You could do it in person. You don't need anything on you as long as somebody is connected to the internet. Okay. And so uh, you begin, in my case, I say, oh, I interviewed this guy, but you could just as easily say, oh, I was watching this show scam school. And I always begin, you know, Hey, do you believe in mind control? Not like, not like voodoo zombie, you know, uh, puppet master stuff, but the idea that we can influence your thoughts with uh, certain words. Okay, because there's this crazy life coach guy who joined me for a scam school, and he claimed that it was possible if I just recited a few lines from a Robert Frost poem, that it would cause you to think of one playing card in the deck of cards. And so you want, you want to give it a try? Sure. Okay. The lines are, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. And then I'll say, uh, now, right now, you probably have flashed a few different cards in your mind, but now your brain wants to settle and end up on just one card. What card are you thinking of? And uh, here, name, name a card. So, so whatever card you say. Oh, you want me to name a card? Sure, sure, yeah. Okay, so Ace of Clubs. Uh, Ace of Clubs, great. I mean, and, and, and at this point, I would put them on defense, uh, saying, saying oh, shut up, you saw this too, right? You saw this episode? They're like, no, what are you talking about? Like, that's what the guy said. No, yeah, I, I, I'm telling you, he's a life coach. Look up uh, 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 Coach Alfred Singleton and uh, find the interview. And so uh, no matter w whether they ask Siri, whether they ask OK Google, whether they look it up on YouTube, whether they um, just search Coach Alfred Singleton, they'll find an interview, uh, you know, throw the word scam school in there. And then they hit it. And sure enough, it's an interview with me and this guy, Coach Alfred Singleton. And he's explaining, you know, how this really will cause everyone to think of the ace of clubs. And in that moment, people are just like, shut up. And then they instantly say, well, I guess that makes sense. Oh, well, you know, the brain's a funny thing. Uh, when in fact, the whole thing is a sham because you'll notice I never say the name of the expert until after I get the card. Right. So in this case, uh, we recorded uh, 104 different versions of the <laughs> video under 52 different names for the expert. and so. Uh, wow. yeah, this is something everyone could try right now. Let's say, let's say you wanted to do, okay, basically, he's either a coach, a reverend, a professor, or a doctor. So doctor is diamonds, professor is spades, uh, coach is clubs, and uh, uh, what was the last one I left out? Oh, <laughs> reverend. Reverend is hearts. And then uh, whether his, you know, his last name, if it's the first five cards, he's a singleton, uh, one through five. If it's the second five cards, six to ten, he's a double day. And if it's uh, the third set of cards, he's a triplet. And then, uh, and then basically within those little neighborhoods, he's either an Alfred, Byron, Charles, David, or Edgar. So A, B, C, D, E. 
So uh, basically, so if somebody says the three of hearts, I'll say he's Reverend uh, Charles uh, Singleton. And uh, the biggest moment of my life was when <laughs> one of my childhood heroes performed that effect on the International Space Station over ham radio to his dad. And uh, as a result, I realized, oh, my God, I designed mind control experiments that were executed on the International Space Station, <laughs> which was a pretty, pretty freaking great thing. So if, if you want to watch the video or get a cheat sheet for all that, just Google uh, mind control scam uh, for scam school and you should be able to find it. Yeah, we will make that available for all of our listeners. I love it. Man. I love the ingenuity and I love the thinking behind it. I mean, it's almost like a game of chess where you're kind of predicting where the person is going to be and in their thinking before they even know. Yeah, as a matter of fact, that's a really good example. And that's why, um, that's why when magic is bad, it's frustrating because imagine, I don't want to say bad magicians because everyone's on their own path, but, but uh, somebody who doesn't have a very good show, oftentimes they make the mistake of thinking they're playing chess against an idiot who doesn't know the rules. And as a result, they don't go out of their way to give credit to the audience to think, okay, they're probably going to suspect X or Y or Z. The good magicians, they're able to project into the audience's perceptions and, and think, well, if I was in this situation, I would be suspicious of this box or I would want to examine these cards or whatever. So what you do is you make sure to do all of that, but you do it out of order. Let's say you got a special card that, I don't know, has something tricky about it and you can't let people check it out. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you do steps out of order. You give them the chance to look at the card before you do the trick. You're like, look, I'm going to do something and you're going to want to look at the card. I'm not going to say what I'm going to do, but I want you to remember clearly that you checked out the card and they do. They check out the card very, very thoroughly. You know, you use what magicians call time delay. And then, you know, when you need the sneaky version of the card, you switch them out or whatever. But all of this is predicated on giving the most credit that you can to the audience and realize that, that you are playing chess to create a moment of genuine magic and genuine wonder. And the only way you do that is by believing that you're not talking to an idiot and going out of your way to make it as fair as possible. You have been listening to the Human Experience Podcast with Brian Brushwood. To hear the rest of this episode, get to thehumanxp.com slash members. This is how we scale the show up. It allows us to move into a video format to bring bigger, better guests on. So become a member today. It helps us out. It helps us sustain the show. Thank you guys so much for listening.